In today's notes, we're looking at how Keynesian views of the economy differ from the classical and neoclassical models. You should pause the video if you need to to write down the objective. First, we're going to look at the classical model, and then we're going to go back and look at the neoclassical model, which is what we've been working on in class, and then we're going to look at how Keynes disagrees with the neoclassical and also the classical model. So first of all, um, the cla in classical economics, there was no distinction between macroeconomics and microeconomics. Um, economics was just one field uh, based on research by people like Adam Smith and David Ricardo, and by this man, Jean-Baptiste Say. Um, Say created what he called Say's Law, which was the idea that supply creates its own demand, which is not so different from the field of dreams line, if you build it, they will come. His idea was that the process of production, okay, the process of production creates incomes, okay, creates incomes, and that those incomes create the ability for people to buy stuff. Therefore, supply, the process of creating things, creates demand, which is the ability to buy stuff. So if you have a very simple economy where everybody's a farmer, some people uh, maybe ha are ranchers, maybe some people are, are raising pigs. So some people have pigs and some people have apples and some people have corn and some people have wheat. Everybody in the process of producing goods is earning incomes, which then enables them to buy goods from other people and money will change hands. Uh, the invisible hand will align buyers and sellers and there's no way that the market could ever be out of this equilibrium. Okay, so classical economists believe that because the market will take care of any imperfections, if, for example, in that simple farm economy somebody was growing okra and nobody wanted okra, um, that person wouldn't derive any income and therefore they would quickly get the message from the market that they needed to spend their resources elsewhere, perhaps in uh, cultivating limes, and they would quickly come up with a product that would allow them to, to get income and then to also make purchases. So the economy would be self-correcting. Uh, in the long run, it would always be at full employment, and therefore governments should leave the market alone. And this is called laissez-faire economics, okay, which literally is like leave the market alone. Okay, supply and demand will even out. We will be at full employment. Okay, everything will be good. Government shouldn't interfere. The Great Depression, of course, which was a worldwide phenomenon, but this is just information about the U.S., really interfere with that perspective. Because as you can see, the economy was, was growing for a long period of time in the 20s. But when it went down in the 30s, okay, there wasn't any kind of quick self-correction. In fact, it just kept going down and down, and then it stayed down. And re recovery did happen, which we're talking about after about you know a, a three or four year period, that things started to get better. It took a long time for them to actually restore back to the long run. And, and that definitely made people lose faith in the classical economists and start looking for other explanations. So we'll come back to Keynes in just a minute and what he had to say about that. But I want to go back to and expand on how neoclassical economists look at this concept now of supply creates its own demand. So neoclassical economists still today, or again today, um, believe that, that we should not be involved, that, we should, that the government should not intervene, and that we should in fact allow the economy to play itself out with supply and demand. So what we want to think about is what's going to happen, and how does this happen? And neoclassical economists use this short-run, long-run model, which we've been using, to explain how self-correction happens. So if you look at this first graph, we're starting right here at equilibrium 1, intersection of short-run aggregate supply 1 and aggregate demand 1, and we have something that causes a recession, say, the housing bubble bursts. Okay? And you can see that in the short run, we are going to shift to aggregate demand 2, right? And we will end up here with rising unemployment, right? And, and a shortfall, um, we're in a recession, people are going to be losing their jobs. And the classical and neoclassical economists believe what will happen, the key here, is that wages will fall. And we talked about that on Monday, okay? Wages will fall. There will be downward pressure on wages because workers are hardly in a position to ask for more money. Um, many people are losing jobs. And when they find new jobs, they will probably find them at a lower wage rate. So once the wages fall, that is the self-correction piece. Short-run aggregate supply moves back to the right, intersects with long-run right here, okay, and we have problem solved. We are back at full employment. 
oops, almost wrote unemployment, back at full employment GDP. Okay, so that is the self-correction process right there. Something happens that shifts us in aggregate demand, we're in a recession, we have rising unemployment, but because there is downward pressure on wages, once the employees uh, accept the lower wages and wages are flexible, then we shift back and we're at full, full employment. Okay, the, the question Keynes asked is, okay, so how long would this take? How long are we gonna wait? Five years into the Great Depression, people were pretty darn impatient about looking for a solution. Uh, in the Great Recession, which is what started in 2007, 2008, uh, three months in, people were desperate for a solution. So it's hard to know how long will it take. Let's look quickly at the, the solution to supply shock. If you can imagine that we have shifted from this ideal short run aggregate supply, we've had a supply shock, say it's the 1970s and oil prices have gone up, okay, and we are over here. Now we're experiencing inflation, okay, and also unemployment. And again, the classical or neoclassical economist would say there's still going to be downward pressure on wages despite the inflation because of the unemployment. Workers are going to be forced to take lower wages, and once there are lower wages in place, okay, short run aggregate supply is going to shift back, back to long run full employment GDP, problem solved. So it, this might strike you as simplistic, but in fact it's actually kind of an, an, an elegant idea. And they've defended it with lots of uh, papers and research. And of course the hang up is that not all wages and prices are flexible. So a neoclassical economist would be pretty quick to argue against things that prevent wage flexibility, such as contracts and price floors like minimum wage and unions, okay, and anything that takes away from wage flexibility which are some of the things that, of course, politically, uh, Americans want to have, or at least some Americans want to have. All right, so that's the neoclassical view, and that's the view that will be pertaining to your assignment tonight. But I want you to also look at, um, let's see, oh, we'll, we'll review this for one more minute. This is a really important point right here. Uh, what's in this box is just a good summary of what we just talked about, which is that long-run adjustments due to flexible wages will return the economy to full employment GDP and no intervention is necessary. It works through short run aggregate supply. So we'll review that concept a few times. But let's go back and look at what Keynes had to say. There's a nice caricature of him. Okay, John Maynard Keynes came along during the Depression, published his most famous book in 1936, but had written a, a PhD thesis on a similar topic. His ideas were, were being incorporated by political leaders. And, and he believed that intervention was necessary. He wasn't willing to wait. He wasn't willing to say the economy would fix itself. Um, and there were, there were two main components to this, and they were investment and savings. Okay? Referring back to what we talked about before, investment is incredibly volatile. Remember the graph that showed investment going like this? Okay? He's, he's pointing that out. Investment's very volatile, and savings is a leakage. So we talked about three leakages. We talked about savings. And we talked about taxes, and we talked about imports. Okay, and we talked about three injections into the spending stream, and those were investment and government spending and exports. Okay, and we're going to just cross off imports and exports right now. Okay, those were, we were very isolationist during the Depression, so not a huge impact. They certainly impact the economy. We're going to set them aside right now. Um, and taxes and government spending. They were used primarily at that time for the provision of public goods, but we're going to come back to those because those are his solution pieces. And we're just going to look at these two, savings and investment. What was happening to those during the Depression? Savings was increasing. People were saving more. Why were they saving so much? Because they were fearful of losing their job okay, and because they were distrustful of banks. So when people earned money, they tended to hoard it. Okay, they wanted to put it in their mattress. They built it into a false wall in their house. Okay, so savings was increasing. The leakage of savings was increasing during the Depression. And we count on investment to, to pick up, right? Where, where the savings leaves and that money is set aside, we expect businesses to be able to access that money to buy new capital. But what was happening to investment? Investment was down. We could not count on it. Okay. When the economy was going down, investment was going down, down, down. Okay. So he made a very important observation, which is income can be earned and not spent in the same year. Okay. People can save, and then that money isn't spent by them, and it's also not spent by businesses. 
So it's just not spent at all, okay? And the economy ends up in a downward spiral. In the circular flow, if you think, look back to the circular flow diagram, households are cutting consumption, therefore businesses are receiving lower revenues, so they're paying less out in incomes, and that households are receiving less in incomes, so they're again paying less out in consumption, down and down, okay? And, and sticking us into this, in this, in this downward trap. So he believed that intervention was in fact necessary. He published his general theory in 1936, uh, and made a huge, a huge impact on the econ profession. Okay, you can look at this cartoon, it sort of plays on this idea of the circular flow, right? The, the businessman, the fat cat says, we'll start hiring you when you find the money to start buying stuff. But of course, the consumers can't find the money to start buying stuff if they don't get jobs first. So, stuck in the downward spiral. All right, another piece of Keynes's view is that he questioned this idea of flexible wages and prices. He, in fact, said wages and prices are not flexible, they are sticky. And if wages are sticky and they're not downwardly flexible, then the AS curve doesn't really look like that. It actually looks horizontal because decreases in aggregate demand do not depress wages and prices. In fact, all they do is reduce equilibrium output levels. Okay, a very important part because if wages are sticky, okay, if people have contracts, if people are unwilling to take pay cuts, then you're not going to have the, the, the self-adjustment take place. Okay, there will be no automatic adjustment. So he saw no level of automatic adjustment happening. Okay, and he used that to argue for his interventionist policies. Okay, so to sum up, John Maynard Keynes argued that the long run could be very, very long, that we don't know how long adjustment would take if it did happen that wages and prices are sticky, so there's no self-correction, and that, in fact, government intervention can help. Keynes was very popular for a long time. In fact, there's sort of a saying, we're all Keynesians now. Um, he has somewhat fallen out of favor. We'll talk more about why um, and, and how the experience of the 1970s shaped views of Keynes. But if you look at this cartoon, I think it really captures pretty well our view toward Keynes right now, which is we have Uncle Sam here saying, Keynes, you are an old-fashioned and useless modern economics has transcended you. And then Uncle Sam starts to have problems, like we did in the Great Recession. Oh, dear, I'm plummeting over a cliff. Save me, Keynes. So we can't expect his policies to help us in bad times. Keynes pulls him back up. It's okay, I got you, thank you. And then he gets back up. As I was saying, Keynes, you're of no use at all. And that's kind of our love-hate relationship with John Maynard Keynes right now. Um, mainstream economics does not necessarily favor Keynes, and yet politically, um, many of our solutions are in fact still Keynesian.